Assalamu alaikum, this is Dr. Mona El Idrisi, author of The Muslim Narcissist. Today I will be speaking about the problematic divorce procedure that people often go through with narcissists. Now there are two different types of divorce procedures that I'll be talking about. The first will be if you decide to divorce the narcissist and the second type will be if they decide to divorce you. Both of these processes are different and they both have different complications, different difficulties and I will be breaking down all the different types of divorce um, for Muslims so in order for you to be able to understand how to go through this process, what to expect and how to deal with it in the best way possible. So let's start off by talking about what will happen if the narcissist divorces you. Now, this is usually called the discard phase. So a narcissist, whether it's a man or a woman, will discard you once they have felt that they have depleted you from every benefit and narcissistic fuel that they could have obtained from you. So they will never tend to do this unless they have a backup option available. And what, okay, I will give you a scenario here for men. So if it comes to men, Let's say if you go through my previous videos, you will understand why narcissists will target codependents and why they will target empaths and the types of benefits that they anticipate to receive from those people. So with men, it's usually finances and social status. So if a woman has married a codependent man because she feels that she could really benefit from the luxury lifestyle that he can offer her or the financial benefits that he could give her, then she will stay in that marriage for as long as they last. So once a man is completely depleted from his finances, from his savings, maybe if he, he might lose his job and you know during the marriage, he might go bankrupt, he might lose a business. Once those benefits end for a narcissistic woman, you will find that this will be the time when she will start to demand a divorce. And this is the discard phase because to narcissists, you are no longer of any benefit to them when the narcissistic fuel runs out. So you will find that they have no more use. They have no use for you. Their their loyalty or their commitment to the marriage will end as soon as those benefits end because the intention, every um, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam tells us that every action will be based on its intention. So if someone's intention is to be in a marriage for financial reasons, then that will have an expiry date when those financial benefits end. And you will find that you will go through a very ugly discard phase with that narcissist. Now, some people may have a backup supply. So a woman may find that she's already secured someone else to get married to who has those financial benefits that she can continue having after you. Whereas other people, other women who may not have done that, will have secured their own future based off your back, basically. So the money that you would have given them would have helped them to save up for their own house, so their own mortgage. Um, it would have got them on their feet to perhaps study, to continue their studies at university. It may have helped them to continue a business, start a business, you may have funded that business for them. So when they discard you, they are already in a position where they are on their feet because of you. You have helped them to get on their feet, to gain a a powerful position in order for them to be able to continue their future without you. And fortunately, this is the harsh reality that many men find themselves in when they 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 realize when they realize that actually this is what this woman has been doing all along she has been securing herself so that she is able to go on without you and in regards to men it is usually the case that they have just found someone else so with narcissistic men it's not usually about finances but it can be i have seen cases where a man has also depleted a woman of her finances and he saved his own money in the process so that he could go on, you know, start a business, marry someone else and so on. 
Um, but with men, it's usually about securing a backup source of supply. So in the discard phase, when a man divorces a woman, it is usually because he is sure that he has a backup source of supply. He's either found another wife, he's taken a secret wife, or he's got women who are interested in marrying him. And they feel safe. So men at this point feel safe to exit a relationship, exit a marriage, when he feels that there is no more benefit in there for him. So in, in this scenario, um, the narcissist divorcing will be brutal. It will be harsh. It will be heartless. They won't care about how you feel because you're, you're no longer of any use to them. And the discard phase is usually when their victims really suffer. They really feel worthless. They feel thrown aside like yesterday's trash. They don't understand how someone can brutally just get rid of them when there's just no more benefits in that marriage for them. And usually it, it will trigger depression in victims when they don't understand the cycle, the cycle of the of the narcissist in relationships. And that this discard phase is unfortunately inevitable. It is inevitable when the reason that they're staying no longer becomes a reason. So it's it's definitely something that a lot of victims struggle with because they don't understand how someone who they looked after for so long and they supported and they loved and they did everything for for so long could just turn around and treat them like a complete stranger, treat them like they're nothing. However, however, on the upside to this, victims who are discarded by the narcissist are actually considered to be very lucky. Very, very, very lucky. Because if the narcissist divorces you, you won't have to go through the horrible divorce procedure when it comes to you divorcing them. And it's a horrible divorce procedure because usually they're not prepared for it. They're not ready to discard you. I'll come on to that in a minute. But looking at it from a third party perspective, I can tell you as a counsellor, I can tell you as someone who has seen this countless times, that if a narcissist divorces you, you are very lucky. However, what complicates this procedure is when you have children. And I'll get onto that as well later in this podcast. However, you are considered to be fortunate if you are discarded by the narcissist because them divorcing you is much easier than you divorcing them. And unfortunately, it is something that a lot of people are going through and the narcissist will do it. They will divorce you when they know that you are very attached to them. They know that you don't want that divorce. When you show them that you don't want the divorce, that is when they'll discard you. When you show them that you're very attached to them, that you're very in love with them, that you want to stay with them, when you beg them to stay, when they threaten you all the time with divorce, they want to see your reaction. They want to see how you're going to cope with that reality. And so when they start threatening divorce, whether it's a man or a woman, when they start threatening divorce, they want to see how you're going to react. If you start crying and you start begging and you start saying, no, please don't leave me, don't divorce, we'll work on this, then they will know that they have you in a position where they can destroy you in the discard phase. That is when they will divorce you. However, if they see that you don't care, if they see that you're actually quite happy for them to divorce you, they're not going to divorce you. They would never do it because they will never give you what you want. And they will prolong the process and they will make they will actually punish you for not caring. They will punish you and they will get worse in their abuse. They will get so much worse because they're in their minds they're thinking, what more could I possibly do to make this person's life hell? To make them actually want a divorce or make them crack? What is it going to take for them to divorce me? Now narcissists because of their ego and their pride they don't want to be divorced they never they never want to be in that position where they're divorced where they are the ones who are discarded never 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 and if you put them in that position you will see hell in all its colors in all its colors because a narcissist cannot stand to be rejected and so 
when they send that when they throw those threats out and they throw them out a lot about divorce it's just for them to test the water to see are you ready for the discard phase or not and they will discard you when they feel that you are at the peak of being so attached to them and being so in need of them that is when they'll discard you because they have this need to see you suffer they love to see you suffer so during this uh during this phase or during yeah during the discard phase when they divorce you it's usually a very quick process if it's a man he will just utter the talaqs and possibly disappear as well if you have children he may completely abandon them too you may never hear from him again i've had clients where you know um they've never heard from their from their ex-husbands again they've just completely discarded them children and all and disappeared from from their lives this is actually becoming more common now because narcissists don't like responsibility they like to punish people so if they discard you then they will punish you and the children too they will punish you by allowing you to be a single parent by allowing you to live without any financial support from them it's like you're no good to me you are you you have no more benefit from me I, there is no more narcissistic fuel and supply that i can get from you so you are on your own now don't expect any financial support from me for the kids don't expect me to be there for the kids don't expect anything from me i'm going to move on with my life i'm going to have another family i'm going to find new sources of supply i'll have more children but you don't mean anything to me don't ever ask me for anything don't look for me don't ever do anything in regards to me. I I am not existent in your life because you are no good to me anymore. So good luck with you and the children. A lot of narcissistic men are like this and they're, they're becoming unfortunately more common because they're getting away with it. Now, the other types of narcissistic men who do divorce their wives um, may not necessarily disappear. They may be around for their kids. However, they just they, they're just careless they don't care they will only care when they see that the ex-wife is doing well again when they see her doing well when they see her picking herself up getting back into education getting back into work you will find that the narcissistic man here may become a bit difficult he may have some demands he may want to come back into that person's life because they hate to see you get back on your feet so there are different scenarios here according to what the man wants from the family situation. Does he feel like he can benefit from having his children in his life? If he doesn't, then he will disappear. Um, but in general, you know, unless he regrets divorcing the ex-wife because the new source of supply wasn't up to his expectation, then you can expect the ex-husband to come back and create issues with the children. So there may be arguments about having the children on weekends or, you know, um, allowing the children to travel. He may create problems with that if he feels that he's regretted divorcing the ex-wife. He will create problems with her children when it comes to arrangements, when it comes to holidays and travel, and it will just become a bit stressful. So especially if the ex-wife does not want to take him back. So here there may be some friction in regards to his relationship with her. However, if it's, if it's gone through court, if it's gone through a court, then there's not much that the narcissist can do in this stage. So he will have to accept the arrangement that was given in court if, that, if, it, if it did go through court. Now, if the narcissist has moved on with someone else, then the ex-wife doesn't have to worry because he's now preoccupied with his new source of supply. So in that sense, in regards to men, um, that is usually the case. That's usually the end scenario of what happens. Now with women, if a woman is the one to divorce her husband, if the narcissistic woman divorces her husband, then what usually happens is she won't, she won't often disappear. Women don't tend to disappear and abandon their children. However, she may also create lots of problems if she regrets divorcing that husband later. Again, 
the ex-husband may rebuild himself, he may come into really good money, he may have, you know, received a great inheritance from his father or his grandparents. And this is when the narcissistic ex will regret leaving the narcissist. So what she will do is she will either attempt to try and come back by love bombing the ex-husband again, or she will create problems with the children, unnecessary stress. If she if she knows that there is no way back in, then she will create unnecessary stress with the children. She will absolutely hate the fact that he may have found someone else. She will create problems with that. She may send her children to spy on the ex-husband and his new wife. Um, they, they do tend to do things like this. So again, if the husband is meant to have the children one weekend or during the Easter holiday, she may say, no, I'm going to take them even though there has been an agreement. And so it causes an issue with the ex-husband because he's made plans to take the children. And this is the kind of stress that would happen when an ex-narcissistic Muslim wife is regretting, regretful of letting her husband go. She will create problems with the children and she will become very jealous, you know, at his um you know, towards his new partner, towards his new wife, fiance, whoever. And she will create problems. Um, she, may, she may also cause problems to split them up. So she may do outrageous things. She may call him excessively. She may cause him stress by sending aggressive text messages. All of these things she that she would assume would cause problems in his new marriage or his new relationship, she will do them. So this is the issue when they divorce you and they want to come back in or they're jealous or they're angry that they may have rushed into divorcing a good man when they see him get back on his feet. So that's what happens when they divorce you, okay? Now, if we go on to when you divorce them, um, actually, just before I go on to that, I just want to... I just want to go, I just want to rewind quickly back to narcissistic Muslim men when it comes to the Islamic divorce. Now, one thing that they usually do to traumatize their wives is to issue three talaqs all at once, um, just to kind of emphasize a very brutal and harsh discard. So he may say, into talaq, into talaq, into talaq, all in one go, just to emphasize that, you know what, I really don't want you anymore. You are trash to me. I'm going to divorce you three times in one go. Now, the Islamic ruling on this is that it counts as one. The reason why it counts as one, even if he says it 20 times, it counts as one because Islamically, there is a procedure to follow after every talaq. So um, a lot of men have been taught that when you say three talaqs in one go, you've used up your three chances. This is wrong Islamically. If you say it three times in one go, it counts as one because... The way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has set out the divorce process, he set it out in a way that it follows a procedure. So if you divorce your wife once, she has to wait those three months. She has to have her idda period. Now, if you don't take her back before her idda period, before the three period menstrual cycles end, then you would have to remarry her with a new nikah contract. So narcissistic men who use islam to you know create spiritual you know to um inflict spiritual abuse on women they will do these kinds of things they will you know just to make it as harsh as possible i will get to the proper procedure of the talaq in a minute but i just wanted to make a note of that because it's just something that um narcissistic muslim some narcissistic muslim men will manipulate and use to create maximum hurt on women so let's go to the second part of this which is um when you divorce the narcissist so what usually happens in this scenario is that you would have tolerated the narcissist for so long now i'm talking to men and women here you would have tolerated their abuse their disrespect, everything that they do to you, their withholding of Islamic rights, the withholding of intimacy, you would have tolerated that for so long. Now, some people will tolerate it because they have children. Other people tolerate it because of very low self-esteem. They feel that 
I have to tolerate this because I've been told that this is what women are like. This is what men are like. Um, I have been taught that it is like jihad and nafs to be patient with your spouse. That Allah will be, Allah hates divorce and that I have to stay in this marriage and I have to make it work. And that I will get a reward for this patience. A lot of people are brainwashed into thinking this way by Islam, by Muslim scholars. And I can't tell you how much it is so wrong to be thinking like this. Because if your mindset, if your mindset is being shaped this way, then you're only inflicting abuse on yourself. You are creating oppression for yourself. You are creating depression for yourself. And so and Allah has not told us to be patient with abuse. We are meant to stand up to it. We are meant to stand up and fight against abuse and oppression. That is what a Muslim does. We don't we don't suck it up and take it in. We have to we have to acknowledge that we're being abused. And a lot of people don't want to face up to that reality. A lot of people run away from it because they're scared to leave the narcissist. They are scared to end up alone. They fear not being being able to find anyone later. And that fear comes from the narcissist breaking their self-esteem down so much. Because of the bad treatment, their victims start to feel that, well, I'm not worthy of better treatment than this. This is what I deserve. The narcissist clearly knows that this is what I deserve. And so who's going to marry me after this? I'm a broken mess. I'm a wreck. I'm not good enough. And so people tend to stay with the narcissist. And a lot of people use the children as an excuse to cover up their weakness to cover up their low self-esteem they like to pin the excuse of staying in a toxic relationship on the children because then it gives it makes them feel a bit better when people ask them why they're staying in a toxic relationship it makes them feel better and more honorable to say that i'm staying for the children when actually the real reason is fear the real reason is fear they they fear um, exiting this marriage and then having another narcissist, you know, ste- being a step parent to, that, to their children. It's all fears. Everything that stops someone leaving a toxic cycle, it all boils down to fear. And so, what usually happens in this scenario is that <clears throat> a victim will eventually get really fed up. There will come a point where a victim will, will just we'll just not be able to handle it anymore because the abuse will get so bad, the disrespect will get so bad that they have to leave now. If they don't leave, everyone will just not blame them any not 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 blame the narcissist anymore for the for the abuse that they're doing. And I say this because I have a client, um one of the clients that I had um was cheated on by his wife seven times. He caught her seven times cheating on him in different in different scenarios so whether that was via text or actually catching her in the act or different 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 scenarios and he tolerated it and he forgave her and he stayed now the people around him knew what she was doing knew that she was betraying him and they lost all respect for him for staying in that relationship now, it got to a point where she disrespected him so much, he came home one day to actually find another man in his house. And that is what pushed him to start the divorce procedure. Because she had just got to a point where she, there was just no respect anymore. No respect. She kept pushing his boundaries to see, what is it that I'm going to have to do to get this guy to actually react? To get this guy to actually do something? And it took that incident for him to start a divorce procedure. And the depression that he got didn't actually come from that from that incident because he had become so numb to her cheating on him. The depression actually came from how other people started to perceive him, how other people started to look down upon him, how other people started to really disrespect him as well because they were noticing and watching him tolerate all this. And actually accept it. So what was happening was that other people started to disrespect him as well. His his closest friends, his family members. And this is when he knew that he needed to get out. Now, when it comes to women, um, a lot of women as well, they come they in the, in the counselling sessions, they come and they say to me that they have caught their husbands betraying them. They've caught their husbands 
you know, saying horrible things about them to other people. They've caught their husband stealing money from them and all sorts of things, but they tolerated it. Um, women have been tolerating being beaten up, being really savagely verbally abused, um, being raped, being, you know, all sorts of, all sorts of crimes are being committed against them. And women have stayed quiet and stayed in those marriages for various reasons. Again, it all boils down to fear, but they stayed using different excuses. However, there is usually a time when a woman or a man will start to initiate a divorce procedure. Now, there are two, two, um, categories here when it comes to divorcing a narcissist there is one the first one is when the narcissist has an idea or has a feeling that you may initiate a divorce procedure and what they will do in this case when they're kind of given a heads up or they know that you're so fed up now that you're going to apply for a divorce or file for a divorce they start gathering evidence against you okay they know that they'll probably be dragged to court. This is where they start gathering evidence against you. Now, if they don't know that you're going to apply for a divorce, if it's something that just comes out of the blue, they receive a letter from the Sharia court or, you know, or any or a letter from the civil court saying that you have applied for a divorce. That is when they get really nasty because it's taken them by surprise and they go into a panic mode especially when they're not ready, they don't have a backup source of supply, they don't have anywhere to go, and they're not prepared. They're not prepared for this divorce. So you'll find that the rage that will come out of you applying for a divorce without giving them a heads up about it, or they didn't feel that you were actually going to take it seriously, you will find that the rage that comes out will make your life absolute hell in that divorce procedure. Now, if they have a heads up, what they will do is that they will gather evidence. Now, the evidence that they start gathering will be um, recordings of you, Re like uh, camera recordings, voice recordings. And what they record is your reaction to their abuse. They don't record the abuse. They will record the reaction to the abuse. So if you go into a complete mental breakdown because they've just beaten you up, and you start screaming at them, that's where they record you. Because they want to show the judge that you're crazy. When you start screaming abuse at them, swearing at them, telling them how much you hate them, that's when they record you. Because when you take them to court, they know that's going to be very beneficial. So they record your reaction to the abuse many times without you knowing and another thing that they do is that they may, for example, if you have uh, friends of the opposite sex that you text message, for example, or you message on Facebook, or maybe you ask for advice, they will screenshot everything, they will hack into everything that you have, screenshot everything, they'll take it to the judge and they'll say that you're cheating on them. Look at you, you know, you're, you're, you're communicating with the opposite sex, you've been cheating on them, they will fabricate anything using the little bits of evidence that they can gather together. Now, this is when they know that you are planning for a divorce. They, they will start building a case against you in secret. And that's why a lot of people, when, you, when they go to court, they're shocked to find all this stuff that the narcissist has gathered against them all this time. And it could be for years. It could be for, like... It could be evidence gathered over the last two or three years. And their victims are shell-shocked in court when they bring out so much, so many recordings and evidence. And, and this is why it's very difficult to fight a narcissist in court who is prepared. Because when they, when they show the judge those recordings of you screaming and hurling abuse and telling, you, telling him they hate them and telling, you, telling them that you hate them, then the judge has no option but to usually believe them and especially when children are involved the judge will see from the from their recordings that you're very mentally unstable and because you never did that to them you never recorded them you've got no evidence against them the judge will take the side of the narcissist and this usually happens with women 
women usually have all this all this evidence and they just and they will give that to the judge and that's why women get a lot get away with so much in western courts so 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 much in western courts because the man will find himself with no evidence whatsoever because he never he never crossed his mind to record any abuse that was going on during his marriage and what will happen is that he will come across as the as an abusive person he'll have his children taken away from him because the narcissistic woman was prepared or the narcissistic man was prepared and that is what traumatizes a lot of men in court because it's unjust it's oppression that's happened against them you know the judge no matter how many times you tell the judge that that was my reaction to their abuse, the judge will say, well, there's no evidence. There's no evidence to show that you were being abused. So that's what they do. That's what they will do when they know, when you, when you constantly tell them that you want a divorce, constantly, constantly tell them, they start building a case. Now, they will also turn the children against you. So if they have a feeling that you're going to divorce them, they will start becoming super nice to the kids, especially the eldest child. They will become super nice to that child because they need that child's loyalty. In court, when the judge asks that child, who do you want to stay with? They will often choose the narcissistic parent because the narcissistic parent during this time of preparation will be the fun parent, will be the great parent, will be the parent that the child wants to stay with. The loyalty will lie with the narcissistic parent. And the victim, the codependent um, parent, will have no idea what's going on, will feel so ex- so exasperated, so frustrated that the children want to stay with the narcissistic parent because the narcissistic parent has brainwashed the children into believing that the codependent parent is the problematic parent. Now, what will happen as well is that the narcissistic parent would often allow the children to see the codependent's reaction to the abuse. So when the children see that the codependent parent is the one screaming, crying, smashing things, swearing and, you know, acting irrationally, then the children will be like, okay, well... This parent is the problematic parent. Now, what a lot of codependent parents do is that they often take their anger out on their children. So they may hit their children, they may shout at their children out of frustration, out of complete frustration. And the narcissistic parent will be as cool cool as a cucumber. So to children, it's a no-brainer. I don't want to stay with my other parent, with the codependent parent. They're the problem. And the narcissistic parent will win. And for this reason, and women are very good at this. Women are very good at this type of manipulation. And that's why most women will get away with it in court. They get away with child custody. They get away with all their financial demands. And they get away with everything they want to do and have in court. Because they know how to play this game. And unfortunately, um, it, it does baffle me how judges aren't clocked on psychologically to these games because it's a pattern that keeps repeating itself. Innocent men especially keep getting um, screwed over in court. They keep getting completely done over because judges are not allowing um, proper psychotherapy, a proper psychoanalysis to be going on in the courts. All the judges care about is the arrangement of these children. Um, and unfortunately, unfortunately, these narcissistic parents don't even want the children. They don't even know how to take care of the children. They're very neglectful of their children. And you'll find that um, I had many clients who told me that the after the court case was finished and the, the, the narcissistic mother got hold of the children in custody, um, the, the, the father was getting calls from the school saying that the children are unhappy, children are depressed, children are not doing their homework. You know, children this, children that. Because the narcissistic parent, the narcissistic mother is being neglectful of her children. They don't actually want the children. Narcissistic women will fight for their children because of the financial benefits that come with them. Period. That is what they do. And they use the children to have power over the narcissistic father, uh, the, the codependent father. 
So they know that as long as they have the children, they can make any demands they want from the father in order for him to be able to see his children. So that could be monetary, that could be time, that could be anything, anything whatsoever. It's just to maintain that control over the father even after divorce. Children gives them that leverage, it gives them that power, it gives them that ability to continue controlling the life of that codependent man even after divorce. So unfortunately, this is why um, a lot of uh, narcissistic women will fight to the bitter end for child custody even when they know that they don't really want the children. Men will do the same. Men will always threaten women to take away their children. So a narcissistic Muslim man, uh, well, this is men in general, but narcissistic men in general, but we're talking about Muslims here. Um, If they know that the mother is very attached to her children, then they will always threaten to take them away. So you will never see your children again. I'm going to take your children abroad. I'm going to go back, you know, to the homeland and raise them there. Um, sends their victims into a frenzy. It's a punishment for divorcing them. Like, how dare you divorce me? How dare you? I will show you. I'll punish you now. You will never see your children again. Now, what usually happens in this case is that narcissists know that you'll take them to court or narcissists know that you'll be forced to go to court for child custody and they know that you'll be depleted of all your finances narcissistic muslim women in particular will take it to court unnecessarily absolutely unnecessarily because these issues can be sorted between both parents child custody and child arrangements however they take you to court because they want to deplete you financially they know that the legal fees will cripple you they know that what you're going to have to pay or they know that they probably will get away with the demands that they make in court And it's just for them to ensure that they can continue taking the benefits that they were in the marriage for in the first place. So if they don't want to be discarded, if they're not ready to leave that marriage, but you're taking them to court and divorcing them before they've depleted you from all the benefits that they wanted from you, you can bet anything that they will take you to court to get the rest of it out of you to get the rest of those financial benefits out of you. It's a punishment. It's a punishment. They, they, it's their way of saying to you, if you think you're going to get away with not giving me what I want, you better think twice. Because I'm going to take you to court. I'm going to make your life hell in court. I'm going to take you for everything that you've got. And you're going to get depleted from all your legal fees, as well, with all the legal fees as well. I will prolong it. I will delay it. I will drag this court process out for as long as possible until I get what I want out of you. Until I see you completely broken, completely drained, completely penniless because all your money has been spent in this court procedure. That is when they'll drop the court case and that is when they will all of a sudden decide that oh, actually you can have the children. I don't know if I'm not sure how many of you have been through this situation But you will find that when you have completely, when you've got nothing, when you're completely depleted, that is when they will say to you, okay, yeah, you can have the children on the weekends. Because now it makes them happy. And what the message that they're sending you is, I put you through all of that unnecessarily because I do have the ability to be civil. But now that I've seen you broken, now you can have the children because I don't want them anyway. You can have them on weekends. I don't care. That is the kind of evil they practice on people. And I have seen this countless times. Countless times over the last 15 years. I've seen it so many times. I know them back to front, inside out. I've seen it in court cases. I've seen it everywhere. This is what they do. And they won't rest until you're completely depleted of everything. They won't rest. Now, one thing to warn you about as well in the court in the in court cases especially with women is that you have to be prepared now you have to be prepared to be accused of everything the lies that will come out that will completely frustrate you that will enrage you will be so bad so severe in some cases 
it has sent victims over the edge. So if you're a man, be prepared to be accused of rape. Be prepared to be accused of ex Islamic extremism. They may tell the judge that you are an extremist, an Islamic extremist, and that you, you know, you, um, you support ISIS and things like that. Be prepared to be accused of domestic violence, beating them up, um, grievous bodily harm. Be prepared to be accused of crimes that maybe, you know, you're involved in robberies, you're involved in um, dodgy dealings and tax evasions and, and, and money laundering and fraud and it will all come out. Be prepared to be accused of all those things, okay? Be prepared to be accused of beating your own children molesting your own children, sexually abusing your own children. Narcissists will stop at nothing. They will stop at absolutely nothing. I had a client who said to me that his ex-wife used to cut herself with a knife. She used to cut her thighs, cut her arms. She'd even cut her wrists. And when she went to court, she had photo evidence of this. She would take this photo evidence to the GP and the GP would write a, lo a letter for her or a note for her to take to court and what she would say to the judge was this is what he's doing to me so he may have wrestled with her she may have um she may have been the one to be you know she she used to hit him she used to throw things at him keys sharp objects vases he said I had everything possible chucked at me so when I used to wrestle with her to stop her from doing it she would use that situation to pretend that I had um, harmed her, harmed her physically. So she would actually cut herself, take take photo evidence and then show it to the judge saying, this is what he did to me when he wrestled me on that day. On the 18th of April, we had a fight that day. Now you can't deny it because it did happen, but she's added the spice to it. She's added that you had done that to her, you'd cut her. And you'd made her suicidal. So slitting wrists and things like that, she will show the judge that, you know, he, he's, he's driving me insane. He's abusing me and he's making me suicidal. I can't stay with him. I need the kids. You know, he, he does this to me. He's not healthy for the children. They will do all sorts of things like that. All sorts of things like that. I've seen outrageous things happen in court with women, especially women. They will cut themselves they will give themselves black eyes. They will do whatever it takes to provide evidence that you are abusing them. So I can't, I can't stress this enough, guys. You know, if you're a young man and you're not married yet, please take this seriously. Because that glittery, beautiful, little narcissistic woman that you meet in the beginning who is feisty and she's rude and she's mean and she keeps you on your toes. And that woman... Is going to ruin your life when she takes you to court, especially when you have children. Please think twice before marrying these people. This is a this is a serious warning to you, because what you're going to go through in court with them when they will eventually divorce you, or when you will eventually divorce them, because it's inevitable. It's inevitable. It's like guaranteed that it will happen. One of you will divorce the other, because you just become it just becomes unbearable to live with them. It will ruin your life. It will ruin your life, unfortunately, going through this horrible divorce procedure. So if you are not married yet, please, please take this, take what I'm telling you seriously. Because I can't tell you the amount of men who have been completely destroyed because of this. Um, women, women too. I mean, women will also, men will also lie about women. Easily. Men, but usually men won't lie about, um... Men won't lie usually about the same things that women lie about, but men will say things that you're mentally unstable, you're crazy. You know, you're, you're not mentally stable enough to look after children, um, that you're dangerous for the children, that you don't know how to raise them, blah, blah, blah. So be prepared to have all of this ugliness held at you. This is what they do. Um, a lot of women, a lot of women all lie. A lot of women, and unfortunately, I've seen so many men go to jail, innocent men go to jail because the judge took the side of the narcissist. Men who have done nothing, men who genuinely care and love their children, 
care about and love their children, men who have been deprived of seeing their children have been thrown into jail or not been given any access to their children or very, very limited access to their children because the narcissist's word was taken. Um, and you've also got the smear campaigns that they do. You know, they'll ruin your reputation if you, you know, when, once you take them to court. They will do everything to to um to completely destroy you. They will tell everyone in your community what what a horrible person you are, how you rape them, how you abuse them, how you hit them and beat them up and and all sorts of things. They will tell and how you're a you know, you're a thief and a money launderer and you know, your risk is not halal and trust me, the whole community will know about it. It's not something to take lightly. When you divorce a narcissist, you've got to be prepared. You have got to be prepared. And I'm I'm not going to go into detail about how to win against a narcissist here. Because what a lot of narcissists do is they listen to these videos and they take the information and use it in their favour. So, you know, anyone who needs help um, fighting a narcissist in court, please do approach a counsellor. Please do approach a therapist. It doesn't have to be me. It could be anyone, but we can teach you how to how to deal with them in court um, because it's really needed. And I've noticed on the YouTube channel, some people have asked if there are any support groups for men. I know a very good support group for men on Facebook. I will not post it because um, I'm not going to post it on the channel because we don't want us to access it. So anyone who wants the name of that support group, any men who need help with court procedures, um, legal help and, and things like that, legal advice, please just send me a DM on Facebook or Instagram and I will send you the link. I'll send you the link to the to the group, okay? Because um, it will help you a lot. It's for people who are who are specifically going through the civil divorce, the, the civil divorce procedure, men who need the support and help, okay? So... Just send me a DM and I'll, and I'll send that to you. Another thing that, um, in regards to the civil divorce process, um, a lot of Muslims get themselves into it. And I generally don't advise people, I don't advise Muslims to get themselves into a civil marriage because of this. Um, a lot of narcissists will push you into getting a civil marriage. And the reason for that is because they want to get their hands on assets that they're not entitled to in the divorce. They know eventually a divorce will happen. So they secure themselves by insisting on a civil marriage. Um, now, I'm not, I'm not telling people not to do it. However, you have to be 150% sure, sure about someone before you get a civil marriage done. Um, I always just recommend to do the Islamic one. Um, but there are many Muslim institutions who encourage Muslims to get the Islamic marriage done because it's usually in the woman's favour. Um, you get a lot of Muslim men who are very neglectful and they don't pay child maintenance. You know, when they when they issue a talaq, they do disappear. And so it's actually Muslim institutions, they encourage women, Muslim women, to get a civil marriage done because, to, you know, to protect them against men who disappear disappearing fathers um who are obviously a narcissist because only a narcissist would do that however it's what they're not seeing is that it's fueling the narcissist the narcissism in muslim women as well so muslim women are taking advantage of the civil procedure and i find it really sad because allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has already given everyone their rights and their due portion of maintenance um in a divorce in an islamic divorce However, because people are not following Islam properly, they're not following the divorce procedure properly, um, Muslim institutions are telling women to get the civil marriage done because that will ensure their rights. Well, hold on a minute. That means that our, you know, that the, the Islamic divorce procedure in, in Sharia courts is not being done properly. So if they're not being done properly, why are these not being fixed? This is the priority. It's the priority that these are being fixed, that no one leaves a marriage without having their rights. Why are people being pushed to doing a civil marriage 
and going through a horrible, horrific, traumatic civil divorce because the Sharia side to it is not being fixed. It's extremely frustrating that we have to rely on a Western man-made system when we have our perfect uh, marriage and divorce procedure system in place by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala already. Why are we giving such power and such a heavy weight to the Western civil system? Even non-Muslims don't want to get married. Even non-Muslims are avoiding it because it's so oppressive, because it's so difficult, because it's so unjust. Non-Muslims themselves are avoiding it. They'd rather stay living with each other as boyfriend and girlfriend. They have their children. They continue life in that way, but just not go for a civil marriage. Let's put them off. And us Muslims, we have a beautiful system in place, but we're being pushed to get civil marriages done and going through this hell where people are paying hundreds and hundreds and thousands and, you know, Muslims are paying hundreds and thousands every single month on legal fees, on legal fees. In Islam, this is not needed. None of these legal fees are needed. So we really need a complete reform of our Sharia court, of our divorce, marriage and divorce system. Because it's it's an absolute disgrace that Muslims are being put, good Muslims are being put through this civil marriage and divorce system with narcissists. So it's something that, you know, I wish to work on, inshallah. This is something that, you know, my intention is to, to try and improve the system because, and create an awareness of, you know, how it can, how it can be improved because we already have such a fantastic and great system. So, you know, um, if you're not prepared for for a civil divorce with a narcissist, be prepared to be completely thrown off guard. Completely thrown off guard. And you'll find yourself in a horrible mess. Horrible mess with so many finances and 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 difficulties. It's stress. It's just very stressful to go through a divorce with, with, with a narcissist. It can take years. It could take absolute years fighting them. A minimum of two years. So, you know, if you don't give them all everything that they want and demand, no matter how unreasonable, how oppressive it is, be prepared to have it dragged out for two or three years. Two or three years. So, that's just a, a heads up warning for those who haven't got into that yet. If you are in a marriage already with a narcissist and you want to get out, Please take this information seriously so you can prepare yourself for what's to come or at least on how to avoid it and how to prepare for it. Um, because if you don't have children and you're living with a narcissist, you need to get out. You need to get out because once they take you to court or once you take them to court over child custody, I'm telling you, the stress that will come out of it isn't worth it. It's not worth it. So if you don't, have children, I really advise that you leave that situation. You, I really advise that you secure yourself with somewhere to stay. Go back to your family house if you have to. Go and, go and live with friends. Go and find a shelter if you have absolutely nowhere to go. Find a charity. Do whatever it takes to exit that situation before you have children. Because raising children in that dynamic... And that family dynamic is only going to ruin them. It's going to traumatise them. It's not going to help anybody. It's not going to help you. It's not going to help the narcissist. And it's not going to help the children. And it's not going to help everyone around you as well. Because unfortunately your family members have to watch you suffer as well. And that's painful for them. So if you have children, take this advice seriously. About how, you know what to do and, and how to prepare. and what, So you know what the narcissist could do potentially do and if you don't have children I advise that you run for the hills run for the hills while you can because divorcing them when you don't have children is much easier than divorcing them when you do now going on to the islamic side of it i i address the civil side of it first because it's the most difficult it's the most difficult procedure to go through i will go on to the four different types of um Islamic divorces. So the first one is the talaq, as you know. Talaq, we've already mentioned that. Um, 
talaq is when a, when a man issues a divorce, when the man has the authority to issue a divorce. Now the talaq procedure is a man will verbalize it. He will say inti talaq. He can write it, he, but it's best to verbalize it. He has to wait three months. She has a idda now. It's counting from the day he has issued the talaq. Three menstrual cycles. Now, if that's ended and the man has not taken her back and he wants to remarry her, he has and he wants to he wants to have her again, he has to marry her again with a new nikah contract and a new dowry. If he takes her back within that three month period, within the three menstrual cycle period, then she's now become now she's she remains his wife and he still has another two talaqs to issue. So let's say he stays with her for another six months. He decides to divorce her again. He issues another talaq. The same procedure happens here. Um, he has a chance to take her back within the three months. If he doesn't, again, a new nikah, uh, new nikah certificate plus the dowry. Now, if he takes her back again within that three-month period, then he has another chance. Well, it's not a chance, but he has another issuing of the divorce. If he issues inti talaq for the third time, that's it. There is no... There is no chance for him to take her back. She will still have her idda period. But this idda period now will be for her to marry someone else. So she will not be able to marry someone else until her idda period is over. Now a lot of men are not doing this properly. A lot of men are still taking their wives back after the three month idda is complete. Without having another marriage contract done. This is Zina. He is now living with her in Zina. I think I may actually make another podcast just about this. Um, just about the problematic understanding of the issuing of talaq. But this is what's going on. And this is what usually happens. This is, this is the correct procedure to follow. Now, as we know, talaq is the last resort. So before that, you know, you have to communicate. You have to, you know, separate beds and, and so forth. So... Talaq is always the last resort. Now, for when a man issues a talaq, it's usually because he's thought about it. You know, it's it's something that's heavyweight, and he's done it because he's he he sees that it's the only course of action to take. Now, the third talaq, when Allah tells us that a man is not able to take his wife back after the third talaq, it's because he wants him to really think about it. He really wants him to think about. Do I really want my wife to marry someone else before I can take her back again? So the only time he could take her back after the third talaq is if she buries another man, consummates the marriage with the man, and then she divorces him out of free will, and then he can take her back with a new nikah contract. Do men really want to go through this? No. So Allah tells us, be careful. You have two chances. Two. Two chances. Once you issue that third divorce, that's it. She has to marry someone else. And uh, with narcissists, like I said, if a, if a narcissistic man is issuing this divorce, he doesn't care. He won't care at all because this is his discard phase. He no longer has any use for you. He doesn't care if you marry someone else. You're no good to him. Now, if a, if a codependent man or an empathic man divorces a narcissistic woman this is when he will trigger a rage the issuing of a divorce will trigger the how dare you divorce me rage that will come out of her and that's when you go through the horrible ugly you know divorce procedure with them now the second type of divorce would be the khula the khula the when the woman asks for a divorce now in the khula um, it's usually done in the court, so it it can be done verbally as well. So a woman can request a divorce, and the man will say to her, "I will divorce you in return for the dowry." That is a khula. Now, if he refuses, then she can take it to court, and a judge will help her to obtain a khula. And the khula procedure for a woman who is divorcing a narcissistic man is very difficult very difficult in in the sharia court and the reason why it's very difficult is because um 
she would have to return the dowry. Now, if a man has been, if a narcissist has been abusive to his wife, Islamically, Islamically, she is not requested to return the dowry. The dowry is returned to a man who is a good man. So in this, we see that in the story of um, Thabit in uh, Radullah Anhu and his wife Jamila, um, when they, when Jamila went to um, the Prophet Muhammad and she said to him, there is nothing wrong with Thabit. There's nothing wrong with him. I just, she doesn't, she doesn't find him attractive. You know, she she says there's nothing wrong with his deen or his character or his morality. He's a wonderful man. But I just don't, I'm unable to fulfill my rights towards him because she's not attracted to him. And she said that I would hate to be depressing him and depriving him of his Islamic rights because I don't feel attracted to him. So the Prophet Muhammad he understood what she meant and he asked Thabit to divorce her in return for his garden, the garden that he gave her as dowry. So... In this context, we can see that the dowry is to be returned to a man who is good. There's nothing wrong with him. He hasn't abused her. He hasn't taken advantage of her. He hasn't. He's not a horrible narcissistic person. Um. So it's out of a. It's a goodwill gesture that you know. Well, if I don't want you, you know, you're a good man. I don't want you. Then you can have your dowry back and you can give it to someone else. That's, the, um, the kindness. That's meant to be shown in the divorce. The same way a man, when he divorces his wife, he doesn't take back the dowry. He doesn't take back anything that he's given his wife. And that's out of mercy. So it's this is what happens when, you know, this is what happens in, in, a, in a civil divorce procedure. However, it's different if a, if a woman had cheated on him, you know. A man wouldn't feel so, a, a man wouldn't feel that kindness in giving her you know, as like assets or her, whatever extra it is that he could give her, he wouldn't feel that he would want to had she, he she betrayed him. So we're talking about a divorce happening in the case where it's it's mutual. You know, I'm 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 divorcing you because I'm unable to give you your rights. I'm doing this out of mercy and kindness by letting you go, and you can have your dowry back. You know, it's something of value that inshallah you can give to someone else. So that's the hikmah, that's the wisdom behind the giving back the dowry. And that is why the dowry needs to be reasonable. I have an article about this. If you go on my website, I have a, I have a whole article about the dowry, what the dowry should be, what's to be expected, and the wisdom behind the dowry. If you go on my website, you'll find it under articles. You can read the full thing there. Um, it will give you a clear indication as to what dowry should be. So the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, don't, don't um, be extravagant in the dowry because if you need to give it back, you, there won't be a hardship upon you, upon the women. And there won't be a hardship upon the man if he's unable to afford it. So if the, if the dowry is reasonable, then um, the man will be able to afford it to get married quicker and a woman will be able to set herself free should she not want to be in that marriage anymore. So when it's extravagant, People find themselves stuck. Stuck because she can't apply for khulat because she can't give the dowry back. And he's stuck with debts that he has to pay off for a long time. But what narcissistic men do is that they will... There are two types of narciss, narcissistic men here. One type will give an extravagant amount of dowry. Why? Because he knows that eventually one day she will ask for a khulat. And she won't be able to go ahead with it because she won't be able to afford the dowry. And he will demand it back in a khulat. So they have no problem whatsoever. Be very careful, women. Very careful when you become very impressed with narcissistic men who give you very big dowries. A lot of women find it very impressive. They see it as love. They see it as, wow, this guy really likes me. This guy really wants to be with me. Look, he's given me a 50k dowry. He's so impressive. Trust me, that will come and bite you where it hurts later. Because he knows that one day... It's very highly likely that you're going to apply for a divorce against him. And if you do, you can bet he's going to ask for every penny of his dowry back. Because unfortunately, the Sharia councils and the Sharia courts that we have will not regard abuse as something to exempt a woman from paying back the dowry. So if, um, so if, so like I was saying before, the dowry is given back to a good man. 
However, if a man is abusive, a woman is not required to give back the dowry Islamically. She's not required. You know, she's entered a marriage, he's abused her. Why should I give her, Why should I go through the hardship of giving back a dowry that I can't afford to give back because he abused me? No, it doesn't make any sense Islamically. It doesn't make any sense. But the unfortunately, the Islamic courts that we have now uh, request the woman to give back the dowry regardless of whether a man is abusive or not. If she's applying for a khula, then it's just a standard. I don't care if he's beating you black and blue. Give him back his dowry because that's what he's requested. That's how you set yourself free. And this is the oppression that happens in Islamic courts. So because a lot of narcissists know this, they're happy to give you as much as you want. As much as you want. Because they know that you won't be able to afford to give it back later and you'll be stuck in that marriage with them because the Islamic court will request that you know, you fulfil his request of giving it back. Now, the other type of Muslim narcissist will get away with not giving any dowry. So he will use Islam to manipulate a woman into thinking that she'll be more honourable and more pious if she foregoes a dowry or, or you know, agrees to a very cheap dowry. It's because he wants it as cheap as possible to get what he wants out of this marriage as easily as possible, without working hard for it. So let's just say, for example, a woman is, you know, a woman has requested £5,000 dowry, and he's saying to her, I can only afford £1,000 dowry. And what he'll start to do is he'll start to brainwash and manipulate her with Islam. Oh, you know, the Sahabia, they were pious, they didn't ask for much dowry. Allah will give you a reward. You're helping a brother get married. You're this, you're that. You're not better than the the Prophet's wives. You're not better than this, you're not better than that. The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam gave Khadija Rabbi Allah 20 camels, 20 she camels and other things. He gave her 20 camels and that is not, you know, people tend to always focus on the man, the poor man who could only afford an iron ring. Because the Prophet Muhammad said that if only if if all you possess is an iron ring, then give that in dowry. But it's because his morality was heavyweight. The Prophet could vouch for that man's character. So he told the woman to accept the iron ring because this man's character is just, you know, amazing. She'll be happy with him. The Prophet Muhammad vouched for him. You could like any woman would marry anyone. The Prophet, the Prophet Muhammad uh, would vouch for, but we don't have those kinds of men anymore. So, they focus on that hadith of the iron ring. They don't focus on the fact that the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu himself gave Khadija radiallahu anha twenty she camels. Now you know the the value of twenty she camels. Now we're talking millions, millions. If you go and find, he gave her the best of them as well. If you go to Saudi, if you go to Saudi and you go to buy 20 of the best she camels, you're paying millions of reals for them. Millions. So it's not about, you know, narcissistic men will always manipulate hadiths and choose and cherry pick them to get away with, you know, to get away with, um, you know, uh, paying as little as possible or making as least effort as possible, not even meeting basic minimum. But that does usually have its advantage when a woman applies for a khula because there's no dowry for her to pay or very little dowry for her to pay. So she will suffer. Women usually suffer in the khula procedure because usually, unlike the civil courts, um, people find that civil courts, the Western courts, um, usually side with the women and the Islamic courts tend to side with the men. And unfortunately, the scholars, well, the, the judges and imams that we have, not all of them, not all of them, but there are many of them, they just don't know. They do not know how to do their job properly as judges and imams. And it's very frustrating to watch because a lot of these judges and imams will not accept evidence from women. They don't understand spiritual abuse. They don't understand mental health properly. They don't understand psychology. They don't understand that verbal abuse and, and emotional abuse is actually very real. And it's, you know, when, when, a, when a judge tells, when an elderly judge tells a woman to fear Allah and, you know, have patience and that Allah will reward her for staying in such a marriage. 
oh, the, la- the narcissist is laughing. He's laughing. Because he knows very well that if he puts on a show, if he puts on a show, oh, just, they'll start crying. They will start crying. They will tell the judge, I love her. You know, I want her, I want her to stay. She's the mother of my children. They will get the judges to feel sorry for them. A lot of men play the victim card. They play the God card in court. And they will say, I don't want to divorce her. Yes, Sheikh, she's just very impatient. I've put up with this. I pay for this. I look after her. I put my children in the best schools. I don't want to, I don't want to accept a khula. I don't want to. And the woman is so frustrated because she knows that it's all a show. That stress of watching a man pretend to actually love you is something else. It's very enraging. It's very frustrating. Because as soon as that man goes home, as soon as that judge says, you know what, I'm not going to issue the khula, you need to go through counselling. And they force the woman to go through marital counselling. She doesn't want to go through marital counselling. She wants out. But because the divorce rates are so high right now, they've skyrocketed. Um, Imams and judges are trying their best to keep the divorce rates as low as possible by not issuing khula easily um actually what happened recently in saudi is that when they made the khula procedure easy but the khula procedure sometimes used to take years by the way in saudi years you would, the, a woman would have to spend so much money on legal fees to get a lawyer and oh god by the end of the whole khula procedure she's completely finished crippled drained of everything um only recently now when bin Hamad bin salman he became crown prince he changed a lot of things and with the feminist movement that's happening in saudi he has facilitated easy khula now so a woman can get a khula in one in one sitting providing that she has the dowry to return so a woman has to be prepared to give back the dowry regardless of whether he's abusive or not if you can give back the dowry you can set yourself free in just one court hearing and in the last two years, um, I remember seeing a report where the divorce rate in Saudi has gone up by 76% because of the, the rush of khula applications that they had online. When that became easy, many women were stuck in marriages for a very long time because the judges would not issue them khula because of their narcissistic husbands. So women do bear that in mind. Don't be impressed. Don't be impressed when a narcissistic man gives you such a high dowry. He'll make you suffer for it later. Um, so unfortunately, that's something to bear in mind. Now, the third divorce would be the fasr. A fasr is when a judge divorces a woman from a husband. So if a man, Islamically, if a man is refusing to accept a khula in return for the dowry then the judge can take it upon himself to release her from the marriage because now he's holding her hostage. Allah has already told men that if a woman offers her dowry, you have to let her go. You have to let her go. You can't hold her hostage in the marriage. This is in Surah An-Nisa. Do not hold her hostage because you are committing oppression when you hold a woman hostage. If she has the dowry to give you and you and you are insisting on not divorcing her, for whatever reason, then it's the matter is taken to the judge and the judge can issue a fasr. Now, if a judge issues a fasr and a woman has already offered you the dowry, then she is under no obligation to give it to you now because the judge had to take it upon himself to divorce her from you. However, again, in many Islamic courts, even when a judge issues a fasr, he still orders the woman to give back the dowry. And this is wrong because this is no longer a khulat now. This has now become a fasr. So it angers me when judges put women in a situation where the man has refused to take the dowry back in return for a divorce. It is now escalated to a fasr, which means another appointment, which means more waiting, which means more delays. And then even at the fasr, the, the judge says, well, uh, I, I've, I've issued the divorce. You need to give him his dowry. Why? Why are our judges doing this to women? Why are there such financial hardships 
on women in the Islamic divorce procedure. Like, it's just really annoying and frustrating that Muslims are being put through this unnecessarily. If a man does not agree to a khula, then he loses his right to the dowry. This is Islamic. This is not from my own head. This is according to the justice system of Allah. You want your dowry? Then be cooperative and accept the khula. Be civil and kind and accept the khula. Accept that this woman no longer wants to live with you. If you don't accept it, then the judge has to deal with it. The judge has to deal with it. But a lot of judges, because they just can't be bothered to deal with the headache from men about them wanting their dowry after, you know, the first, they just give the men the dowry. You know, they, they ask women to do it. So there's a lot of oppression going on in our courts. A lot. A lot of oppression. And that is why the Prophet Muhammad said that the judges and the imams and the scholars will be on the front line of being judged. And the majority of them, unfortunately, will go to hell because they're oppressive, because they're not ruling properly. They are putting people in difficulties and hardships because the Sharia system is not being run correctly. And so men, you know, if a woman does not want to stay with you, it's, it's, you will be rewarded. You will be rewarded if you let her go in kindness. Let her go in kindness. And if you forego the dowry, if you know that it's a hardship for her to pay the dowry, to exit that relationship, to exit that marriage, and you forego it, then Allah will give you double the reward. And you will find that, subhanAllah, you will find that you will marry someone so much better, someone more compatible with you. Allah will reward you with that. He will reward you with some sort of risk. Even if it's not a wife, he will reward you with better risk because you showed compassion towards his creation. That's what he's asked you to do. If you see a woman doesn't want to be with you anymore, she can't afford to give you the dowry back, forego it. Just let it go. It's out of mercy. If that woman has not done anything terrible to you, then find it in your heart to let it go. And if you can't let it go, if you do want that right, then it's completely within your rights to take it. Then women, you need to put yourself, you need to hold yourself accountable for that. Because in the beginning, a lot of women prance around and they're like, yeah, he gave me 20k, he gave me 30k dowry. You show off about it to all your friends. And then you're stuck later when that man is betraying you and that man is treating you terribly and that man is not, you know, inflicting narcissistic abuse upon you. What are you going to do with that 20, 30k dowry then? Put yourself in that situation. You have to think about it that way. Entering any marriage with someone has some element of risk. There is an element of risk in any marriage you choose to enter. Unless you know that this person is truly a God-fearing person. And this is why the Prophet Muhammad said, marry the God-fearing person. Marry the God-fearing man, marry the God-fearing woman. Because they will be God-fearing in everything with you, in every procedure. Marriage, divorce, children, in-laws, marital, um, marital duties. They will fear Allah in everything. And people will vouch for them as well. Because they've always been like that. They're the only people who, when you enter a marriage with them, the risk is so low or there's no risk at all. Alhamdulillah. You're blessed to find people like that. If you've found someone like that, you're very blessed. But if you haven't, then there's an element of risk. There's an element of risk that you have to make account for. Okay? So be very careful when you ask for a high dowry. Be very reasonable. Because women, that khulat procedure with a narcissistic man is hell. It's horrible. It really is horrible. So the women who have managed to exit it quickly are those who have been able to pay the dowry back. Those who've been able to pay the dowry back. So be reasonable, you know. You have to, like, following the sunnah, following the sunnah will benefit everybody. You know, extravagance, extravagance got no, got people nowhere. It gave you that social status. It gave you, you know, um, the validation that you wanted from society. Yes, it will give you that. But no one will be there to save you in the court. No one will be there to save you from the narcissist. And their lies 
and and everything that they that they come with you'll be shocked it's people have been traumatized in court absolutely traumatized so i hope this podcast has helped um i did try to touch upon everything possible all types of um divorce and um it's very important that you take it seriously again if you if you're not married then these these podcasts inshallah will be very beneficial for you because it's important for you to know what could potentially happen if things go wrong with the narcissist later what would happen if your supply runs out what happens when you marry someone who has a dishonorable intention towards you all of this is really important if you want to avoid all of this choose better people to marry even if they're not as glamorous i mean again have a look at my previous podcasts about why men marry narcissistic women and why women marry narcissistic men it's all in my book all of it's in my book these podcasts just elaborate more on the points that i have written about in my book i just i like to uh it's an opportunity for me to expand, to expand and explain more about, you know, the divorce procedures and, and, and the dangers of marrying narcissists. Marrying narcissists will ruin your life, will absolutely ruin your life. Unfortunately, unfortunately, they just happen to be the best looking people in our societies. A lot of people fall for them because they're good looking and a lot of them have a good lifestyle. And they do that. That's what they focus on when they grow up because they know that this is what makes them attractive to people. So I hope it's a bit of benefit. Um, please leave your comments below. Let me know if there's anything that I've missed, anything that you'd like me to address in another video. And um, please share this with people who could benefit from it. Please do. If anyone needs any help or counselling, please reach out to me. You can email, you can email me at author at com. And I'll respond to you. Um, even if you just have a quick question, just send it to me in a DM on Instagram or set, or drop me an email. Um, especially if you need to know the... Especially for men who want to know where that, that Facebook group is for help and support with civil divorce cases, especially when they're being oppressed by narcissistic women. And if you need help navigating the procedure with a narcissist, so whether it's a man or a woman... If you need some help and advice in getting through or some coaching in getting through the divorce process, do reach out to me or any other Muslim um, counsellors and inshallah we can help you um we can help you do that because it's just really it's just really important. It's really important that you know. And like I said, I can't make a detailed video about that because if we make detailed videos about this, then they will just clock on to everything that you do and they'll just manipulate them as well so i hope that's helped inshallah um i've got some more interesting podcasts coming up being lined up and please do let me know if you benefit from these it really means so much to me when i know that that you are benefiting and it's really helping and until the next podcast inshallah assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh